Why was a New Mexico man found dead in Mesa when he was supposed to be getting treatment for addiction? They get them to fill out the necessary paperwork, and then the sober living home starts to get the insurance. Certainly will be one of the worst frauds in the history of Arizona and one of the biggest scandals we've ever seen. Native Americans are being kidnapped and forcibly brought into group homes. Tactics like these set up a false promise of safe haven and treatment while defrauding the state Medicaid system without actually treating anyone. Yes, that's right. In America, private organizations have been picking up intoxicated people from outside of liquor stores and from off the street, under the guise of helping them get sober. But in reality, they're kidnapping them, plying them with more drugs and alcohol, and keeping them captive. All for some of that sweet, sweet taxpayer money. This is how. From 2021 to 2023, Two billion dollars was stolen from the American taxpayer in just one state. In one of the biggest Medicaid fraud schemes in the history of Arizona, so far, involving hundreds of fraudulent drug and alcohol rehab facilities. The FBI says the scams began in 2019, proliferated during the COVID pandemic, and have since become the big new fraud scheme in America, or at least one of them in what amounts to, essentially, taxpayer-funded human trafficking. Every day it's somebody new that's missing from the res, and they were all brought out here for rehab, and now they're all on the street. What makes the substance abuse rehab market so attractive to fraud? Well, there's a lot of money in it. Even though substance abuse rehabilitation is the minority of rehabilitation, it alone is worth an estimated $42 billion in the US. And there's a lot of different places, on different levels of government, with programs and spending, that sometimes overlap, and sometimes don't. The federal government is spending more than it ever has in 2024 on the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA's budget is $10.8 billion, with about two-thirds of that specifically for substance abuse treatment programs. Contributing to the market size of drug abuse rehabs is states funding, some of which is really federal funding via them, some of which is not. Then there's private funding, rich people going to $9,000 a week spas, others paying through insurance. All in all, the substance abuse rehab sector is a sliver of the healthcare market, but that market is massive. In 2022, private health insurance spending was $1.3 trillion, and together Medicare and Medicaid spending was about $1.7 trillion. Of that $1.7 trillion, it's thought about $100 billion was probably stolen. For health insurance's $1.3 billion, who knows? Even the $100 billion number is an expert's guess. It could be much more. The point is, healthcare is a really big slice of the yearly cake that keeps blood pumping and funds Thomas F. Frist's ludicrous lifestyle. This guy is worth $20 billion thanks to co-founding a company that runs hospitals for profit. He didn't invent anything, or innovate in any way, he just made a company with his brother and his dad in the 60s that set up private hospitals. And now, he's the richest man in Tennessee. But anyway, I do digress. So yes, there's a lot of money to be made, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a big problem. The suffering, the horror, the anguish. How can anyone quantify that? Well, with a dollar amount, of course. The health department's figures from 2023 say that the annual economic impact of substance misuse is estimated to be 249 billion for alcohol misuse and 193 billion for illicit drug use. The Recovery Centers of America reckons it's about half a trillion in tangible measured costs and 3.2 
trillion intangible costs, a figure that consumes the equivalent of the combined GDP of 45 of the 50 U.S. states. It's a scam flying under the radar because not all insurance companies double check for licensing. So what is required to open an addiction rehab center? It depends on the state. It always depends on the state. And in some states, very little is required. Where I live, for reasons that elude even me, in Kentucky, addiction is a major public health issue. Yet, to open an addiction rehab center, all you have to do is fill out a four-page application with basic business contact information, pay a $500 fee, and apply for a certificate of need with information about the facility's location, which gets approved by the fire marshal. That's it. Only if you're going to dispense medication like methadone will you need any kind of medical accreditation. In fact, there are lots of websites for companies that offer consulting services on opening a facility like this one, with this article titled, It's easy to open an addiction treatment center in Kentucky. Here's how to get it done. And it promises their app will make it easier and more profitable to operate an addiction treatment center. Now, in this video, I'm focusing primarily on sober living houses, which is where most of the fraud in Arizona occurred. A sober living house or sober living home is ideally a place where people recovering from alcohol and drug addiction live together in a structured environment, supervised 24 hours a day by psychiatric or medical professionals. Typically, the people being supervised are there after leaving a more intensive drug and alcohol rehab facility. These homes usually involve regular drug and alcohol testing and therapy to aid residents in staying sober. However, there is little to no regulation regarding sober living homes in the US. Regulations that do exist are all on a state-by-state -state basis. From what I can tell, seven states have a voluntary certification process and only three states require mandatory licensing, Utah, New Jersey, and now Arizona since 2020. Those requirements often have loopholes that are easy for scammers to work through, as we shall see. So here are the steps of how this scheme generally worked, using Arizona as an example. If you want to open a fraudulent sober living home because you have no soul and bilk taxpayers out of millions, Here's how. Step one, set up a limited liability company for your sober living home. You can do this yourself, registering with the state for about $50. An LLC is ideal because it involves limited liability and can easily be dissolved when things go awry. If you get shut down, you can just open another one under a different name. You're supposed to get licensed to operate a sober living home in Arizona, but don't worry, there are ways around that. Step two, rent an Airbnb in a suburban neighborhood for a short amount of time, a month, 90 days, whatever. Step three, get a van or an SUV, something big that can fit a lot of people and go drive around an Indian reservation or close to one. Native Americans have higher rates of drug and alcohol addiction than the general population although the homeless are a good target too. Native American and homeless? ka -ching. Also, go drive around gas stations, flea markets, medical clinics, and liquor stores near Indian reservations. Find someone walking around who appears to be intoxicated. This is 2024, so there are loads of them. Convince them to get in the van. There may be many ways to do this. You could say that you can help them get free therapy and rehab, and help them get their lives together. Or you can lie. You could tell them you were sent by one of their family members to give them a ride home. Or you could offer them drugs and alcohol if they get in the vehicle. Ideally, the person will be too intoxicated to understand what's happening. If you're careful, you could even find somebody passed out in public and physically haul them into your vehicle. Whatever it takes, 
Just get them in that van. Go to homeless encampments. Make promises you can never keep. Lie, lie, and lie. Just get them in the van. Once they're in the van, give them drugs and alcohol. It's free for them because the idea is to keep them inebriated during the trip. Once you have a full van, go back to your Airbnb, I mean sober living home. Step four, get them to sign up for the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System or AHCCCS, usually just called ACCESS. It's the state of Arizona's Medicaid program for low-income people and includes the American Indian Health Program, which pays for healthcare services for Native Americans. You can fill out the application for them. All you need is their ID and a signature. Remember, it's ideal for them to be drunk or drugged up during this process so they don't understand what's going on or what they're signing. You can also ask them to hand over their food stamps just in case everything you did before wasn't evil enough. Step five, once their benefits are approved, which can happen in as little as seven days, time to start billing the state. For each person in your sober living home, you can receive up to $7,000 per month in Medicaid benefits. In some circumstances, you can get even more than that. And the best part is, you don't have to do anything. Just keep giving your patients drugs and alcohol to keep them subdued. Tell the state that each of your patients are receiving therapy for eight hours a day, five days a week, at a cost of hundreds of dollars per hour. Buy some $10 drug and alcohol testing kits and charge the government $1,000 for each test. Give each resident one test per day every day and you'll be rolling in money in no time. They will fail these tests since you're ensuring that they stay drunk or on drugs. Then you can tell the government that these people need more therapy in your facility so you can keep getting approved for more months of pay. And if you're a real white dog turd, you could take this even further. Bring in a patient for only one single day, then kick them out, but pretend they are still living in the house so you can keep charging Medicaid for months. That's where the real money is, because this is a numbers game. The more patients you serve, the more money you make. You could even go so far as to register non-existent patients, people who are dead or currently in prison. Once you're rolling in cash, you can hire drivers to travel all over the state doing this for you, or even out of the state. You could send someone to reservations or homeless camps hundreds of miles away to fill up your vans and drive your patients back to Arizona, where you could falsify documents to make it seem like they are in-state residents. They don't even have to be Native Americans. Pick up some white people too, and just tell the government they are Native Americans. But what about licensing? No worries. Instead of getting licensed, you can work out a deal with a clinic that does have a license, where you'll pay them a kickback for every patient they give you. Then, the licensed clinic will do all the actual billing to the state, so you can avoid detection. And if you ever do get caught, no problem. Dissolve the LLC, cancel your Airbnb rental, and start a new LLC at a new Airbnb. Ideally, just a few doors down. Before you know it, You'll be rolling in millions and millions of dollars. But don't worry about any heat, because you're not the only one doing this. There are hundreds of facilities doing exactly the same thing. Until the American taxpayer has lost $2 billion over two years in just one single state. They allow them to use fentanyl. They allow them to drink still. So they'll call Axis up and say, hey, they relapse. I need another 30 days. So the 7,000 she talked about continues for another 90 days. The FBI says that this exact type of scam started in Arizona in 2019. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs and Attorney General Chris Mays have said that authorities believe the first of these scams were started by a criminal syndicate in Nevada before being replicated by various individuals in Arizona. Throughout Arizona, people from a variety of backgrounds and fields 
started to hear rumors about these facilities quite some time ago. For example, a police officer from the Navajo Nation named Roland Dash, who worked in Tuba City, Arizona, came to work one Monday morning in November 2021 and noticed that nobody had been arrested over the weekend. Typically, there would be 15 to 20 arrests for public intoxication on an average weekend, but this time there were none. So he took to the streets and started asking around, trying to figure out what was going on. He met someone who told him that a white van had been parked outside a strip mall, asking people if they wanted to go to a residential rehab facility down in Phoenix. Dash contacted Navajo Nation detectives, who also noticed white vans driving around the reservation handing out business cards. They found that at least 40 different sober living facilities were actively recruiting on reservations. Then, in late 2022, the Navajo Nation's Attorney General, Ethel Branch, started hearing about the problem during her campaign for office, but the available information was very speculative, unclear, almost like a rumour. And it was difficult to collect evidence of what was happening, because the people being targeted were transient, had mental health and substance abuse issues, and were difficult to contact and locate, which again, is what made them the perfect group for exploitation. Other members of the Navajo Nation began investigating what was happening as well. A woman named Reva Stewart began noticing something strange in the park across the street from her shop. White vans loitering around the park, talking to native people. Stewart says that she's nosy, so, being nosy, she went across the street and asked a man what the people in the white van wanted. He explained that the person in the van was asking if he needed a place to go, because they had a place where they could take him. Soon, what was really going on became more and more apparent to more and more people. Later, in 2022, Stewart's own cousin at the Navajo Nation in New Mexico was approached by a similar van. Stewart's cousin had been struggling with drugs and alcohol for some time. The man in the van approached her and offered her a drink and a place to go. When she sobered up, she had no idea where she was. It turns out, she had been driven from New Mexico to a sober living facility home in Phoenix, Arizona. She managed to leave the facility and contact her family, and at this point, Stewart says she started putting the pieces together. Reports of missing persons on reservations had been surging, and always after mysterious unmarked vans and SUVs, had been spotted in the area. Stewart, a normal person, not a law enforcement person, just a citizen, started an advocacy group called Stolen People, Stolen Benefits, and began trying to help families locate their missing loved ones who had been taken to sober living homes. Some of these people were straight up kidnapped. In one case, a Navajo man in Farmington, New Mexico, was driving down the road when his car broke down. He got out and started walking, and a short time later was approached by a black SUV offering him a ride. He got in, and at some point he fell asleep, and when he woke up, he was 400 miles away in Arizona, being taken to a sober living home in Phoenix, which had signed him up for Arizona's access system and began collecting payments for treatment at the home immediately. For three months, his family couldn't find him, as he was shuffled between various homes with no money and no idea how to contact them. The scale of the problem would come into focus, as tribal leaders and tribal police across Arizona began sounding the alarm on what would later be called a public crisis. At some point around this time, the FBI got wind of this and started investigating. In January of 2023, the agency put out a public statement asking for victims of these schemes to come forward. The person to really bring this to the attention of the public at large was investigative journalist Justin Lum 
at Fox 10 News in Phoenix. Months before the FBI statement was released, Lum had received tips from residents of a gated suburban neighborhood in Phoenix, where several dozen sober living homes had suddenly popped up. Residents told Lum that there were people intoxicated and passed out in driveways and yards all over the neighborhood. On some occasions, residents would wake in the middle of the night to severely intoxicated people banging on their front doors with no idea where they were or even trying to break into their house. Lum began an investigative series called Praying on a People. The first piece in the series came out in February 2023 and broke down how the scheme worked. In some of the facilities, the house would contain nothing but mattresses on the floor and a little bit of food in the kitchen. In some of them, the patients were given alcohol and locked in bedrooms of the houses all day long. In others, patients were given cash to buy drugs and alcohol and were free to come and go without any supervision at all. In some, the houses were not segregated by gender and women were sexually assaulted without it ever being reported to police. Some of the facilities went so far as to recruit non-Native Americans from homeless camps, including some who didn't even have drug or alcohol problems, offering them free food and shelter if they joined, and making money from them by signing them up to Medicaid benefits specifically for Native Americans. In some cases, people were transported from across the country, from as far away as Montana, South Dakota, and even Alaska. Some would be put on a plane out of state and picked up at the airport in Phoenix, then transported to the facility, where staff would sign them up to access benefits, fraudulently claiming they were residents of the state. Others would be picked up off the street in other states and driven hundreds of miles to Phoenix, and were given alcohol or drugs to consume the entire journey. On occasion, the prospective patient would arrive at the sober living facility and refuse to sign the paperwork for access benefits, so they would be put back in the transport vehicle and dropped off in downtown Phoenix, having no idea what state they were even in, having never been there before, and being left to figure it out for themselves. In other cases, facilities would bring someone in, sign them up for benefits, and kick them out the same day, but continue charging the state for treatment of that person for months. Sometimes, that person would end up dead or in prison, while the sober living home continued collecting benefits for them. There are even some cases where the sober living home didn't even bother renting out a house. Some would just rent motel rooms and put people in there. And some of these patients weren't picked up off the street at all. Some were individuals actively looking for sober living homes, who came across one of the facilities online, only to discover later that the home provided no treatment services of any kind. They were just conned, and some of those were able to just leave, while others were locked inside. And of course, there were deaths involved. The way it was positioned, it was put out on the street. There's no way that they died right there. In one case, a 44-year-old man named Carson Leslie was picked up while intoxicated and transported to one of these sober living homes. There are indications that he died of alcohol poisoning during the car ride before even getting to the home. And the operators of this facility dumped his body on a sidewalk in the neighborhood where it wasn't discovered until a woman walking her dog came across it and contacted police. In another instance, 32-year-old Fernando Largo was found dead from an overdose in Mesa, California, in a hotel room registered to a company called Opportunity Changes. The hotel room was the sober living facility. And the amount of money pouring into these facilities was extraordinary. The state was charged thousands of dollars for alcohol addiction treatment for a four-year-old. Another facility charged over $1.2 million 
for one year of alcohol treatment for a woman living there with her children. If it costs $1.2 million to treat one person for one year for alcoholism, surely it's just more efficient just to give them that money one time. I mean, how much of an alcoholic do you have to be? Yeah, I'm an alcoholic, I have a problem with it, but I'm still very discerning. Is there gold leaf in that special brew? Because if there isn't, don't talk to me. State officials got involved in investigating this alongside the FBI in early 2023. As more information came to light, the amount of money that was thought to be stolen grew and grew and grew. At first, state officials thought this involved up to 100 sober living homes and that they'd collectively stolen hundreds of millions of dollars. But by the end of 2023, the numbers were up to 300 facilities involved and a billion dollars stolen. Now, in the first half of 2024, the total money thought to be stolen is estimated to be about $2 billion. It's worth remembering that this is Medicaid money. A majority of it comes from the federal government. So it's not just Arizona residents who paid for all of this. The entire country is paying for it. As far as Arizona goes, state officials announced in May of 2023 that they were suspending payments to 100 facilities in Phoenix alone, and that reforms would be put in place to ensure better oversight of how these places get licensed and operated. Or, you know, any oversight at all. Some people might think it's too little, too late. The two people who died that I mentioned earlier there's currently a wrongful death lawsuit against several Arizona health agencies, alleging that the loopholes, mismanagement, incompetence, indifference, and sheer lack of oversight by these agencies caused and created a proverbial tidal wave of easy and false billing opportunities for fraudsters. So, you may be wondering who the hell were the people operating these places? Well, from what I can tell, so far there have been about a dozen arrests on charges relating to fraud, but the investigation is ongoing, so it's still somewhat murky. But in one case that I can tell you about, a 42-year-old woman named Diana Marie Moore from Mesa, Arizona, was indicted on federal charges of wire fraud and money laundering and she pleaded guilty to those charges in July of 2023. She admitted to operating two different facilities called Harmony Family Services and Harmony Family Services 2. Great name. And was in the process of opening a third facility called, can you guess? No, I was joking. Logan Family Health, LLC. Moore, before this, was a convicted felon and she failed to disclose that on her application to the state. Beginning in January of 2020, she started paying other providers to transport people enrolled in the Access program to her facilities, where they would stay for a single day, just long enough for her to get their Access identification numbers. Then, she would bill the Access program for counselling services for eight or more hours a day, five days a week, for months in a row, even though she knew no such services were being provided. From 2020 to 2021, she collected over $22 million in payments from the Access program. Some of the people she claimed to be treating were dead. Some were in prison. So, what did she spend all that money on? You guessed it. Tat. Absolute tat. As part of her plea agreement, she agreed to forfeit various items she had purchased with the stolen money. Four houses, seven luxury vehicles like Mercedes Benzes, and over 100 items of luxury goods, including artwork, sculptures, designer jewellery, Rolex watches, a mermaid statue, a Versace crystal wine decanter, designer clothing, and a room full of Louis Vuitton handbags. More sentencing was scheduled for September of 2023, and then to December, and I can't find anything about her after that, so the sentencing may have been delayed a third time. 
I'm not sure. What I can say is that she was facing a total of 30 years in prison, and it seems like she earned every second of that. Anyway, as I said, this is all ongoing, and who knows how widespread these schemes really are. Justin Lum has said he's been in contact with officials from other states who believe the same type of fraud is happening there. So who knows how deep this rabbit hole really goes. So, what are the solutions? In general, it looks like scams in the addiction treatment industry are a major problem. The Hazelden and Betty Ford Foundation, which advocates for nationwide industry reforms, points out that the substance abuse rehab industry is largely unregulated. Deceptive billing, overbilling, insurance fraud, deceptive marketing, these are many facets to this crisis. Patient brokering is an especially egregious practice, in my opinion, where facilities pay third-party call centers to perform lead generation. So somebody Googles addiction treatment center and finds a 1-800 number. They call it and are told they are talking to an addiction treatment specialist who will refer them to an appropriate center for treatment. But what's actually happening is they're talking to an unqualified call center salesperson who takes down their information and sells it to the highest bidder, including fraudulent treatment centers. There are a number of legislative changes recommended by the Betty Ford Foundation to help counteract the fraud in the system, like establishing uniform quality standards, creating an enforceable regulatory framework, banning patient brokering services, empowering the Federal Trade Commission to investigate and prosecute deceptive practices, and much, much more. And I agree with all of those recommendations, although I will say, bit obvious, isn't it? It's almost like the whole intent is not to have this so crooks can make money. That's just me saying that, you know. There's a lot of work to be done if we want to prevent things like this from happening again. And it obviously goes far deeper than any individual industry or sector. This is a social problem. Preying upon society's most desperate and most in need, I'm both unsurprised and perpetually revolted. If we don't burn down this cycle of corruption, apathy and greed, it will just get worse and worse and worse. So that's the video. Thank you very much for watching. I'd just like to say that if you have problems with substance abuse, you shouldn't feel ashamed. You can get help. You can beat it. And there is really much more to be ashamed about in the modern day slave catching that these people are doing. Absolutely revolting. At the top of the description, there are legitimate links to uh, stuff about substance abuse. If you do want to get help, I'm not affiliated or sponsored by them in any way. They're just good links. All right. I believe in you. You can do it. You can beat them. Fuck these people. Bye bye.